Welcome to lecture number 76, Historical Topic 7.8, Cultural and Political Controversies of the 1920s. There are two themes since there are also two learning objectives. Those are migration and settlement and American and regional culture. The first learning objective is explain the causes and effects of international and internal migration patterns over time. The first key concept says that by 1920, a majority of the U.S. population lived in urban areas, which offered new economic opportunities for women, international migrants, and internal migrants. Women were allowed to work in new urban professions as clerks, nurses, teachers, domestic workers, and having their own income gives them a greater degree of independence, though they are still being paid less than men for similar types of work. The 1920s brought new fashions. Women dressed in less restrictive attires. Their dresses were looser fitting and had higher hemlines. The flapper was the quintessential woman of the 1920s. They wore their hair short, wore glamorous long jewelry, and wore their hair short. Women also started to use contraception more frequently. Advocates like Margaret Sanger, seen in the top left, advocated for having fewer children or delayed childbearing. This allows women to have more years to work and be more independent and also to pursue education or other professional pursuits. Sanger founded the American Birth Control League to expand the information to women on contraception. The issue of contraception continues through the middle of the century and it's going to get even larger as it develops into the abortion debate. At the time, states pushed towards providing universal high school education. This helped women because more of them are having the ability to continue their education and expose them to new fields or the possibility of college or university. For international migrants, there was legislation that heavily impacted migrants from the Eastern Hemisphere. Those migrants are covered in the following key concept. Migrants coming from the Western Hemisphere, those from Latin America and Canada, were not heavily impacted during this period. Mexican immigrants began to come to the United States in seasonal migrations to fill labor gaps. It started in World War I. They came to fill the gap left by men who were fighting in World War I. At the end of World War I, these seasonal migrations continued. Mexican immigrants would come to the United States to work either in agriculture or manufacturing. At times, the migrations would reach the northern United States and also the Midwest. These migrants can also be referred to as birds of passage, similar to Italian immigrants in the previous century who came with the intention of returning back to their home. The largest wave of internal migrants include the first Great Migration. It was covered in an earlier lecture and there will be a second Great Migration during World War II. It's composed of African Americans who left the South towards northern, midwestern, and western cities. They were trying to escape discrimination, segregation, threats of violence, and exploitative labor structures like sharecropping. From this migration grew other African American movements like Marcus Garvey's Back to Africa movement. He wanted to get black Americans who were experiencing discrimination in the United States and create a colony somewhere in Africa. Garvey had controversial ideas and he even clashed with some of his contemporary civil rights leaders like W.E.B. Du Bois, but his main contribution is that he grounded his ideology in black pride. That's seen again in the Harlem Renaissance. Eventually, Garvey is jailed over the fundraising that he was doing for his venture. He was accused of fraud, tried, and convicted. He served prison time but eventually was released on the condition that he be deported to his native Jamaica. This next key concept covers the immigration legislation more deeply. After World War I, nativist campaigns against some of the ethnic groups led to passage of quotas that restricted immigration, particularly from Southern and Eastern Europe, and increasing barriers to Asian immigration. Nativism was fueled by anti-German sentiment, and then that erupted further into the Red Scare. It was a continuation of the previous nativism that came from the second wave of immigration when Americans didn't want Southern and Eastern Europeans coming to the U.S. Some of it was fueled by social Darwinist ideas as well. By 1921, there's enough support in Congress to put a limit on the immigration that's coming. In 1921, Congress passes the Emergency Quota Act, and it limits countries to 3% of their total immigration from the year 1910. That means that if Italy had sent 100,000 people in 1910, for 1922, they would only be able to send 3,000 people. It's a huge reduction, and in 1924, the quota is reduced even further through the National Origins Act. It goes down to 2% and changes the baseline year to 1890, a time before most Southern and Eastern European immigration happened. It was an attempt to try and stop all immigration from Eastern and Southern Europe altogether. However, these two pieces of legislation did not apply to the Western Hemisphere. That means the Latin American countries were not capped in any way in the number of immigrants to the United States. That will continue until 1965. The Sacco and Vincetti trial were also covered in a previous lecture, and it highlighted the level of anti-immigrant sentiment in the U.S. at the time. They were Italian immigrants who were anarchists who were convicted of murder despite some clear due process concerns during their trial, and then a denial of an appeal despite recanted evidence from the original trial. They were finally executed in 1927. 
Finally, the KKK expanded to the intimidation of immigrants. They're no longer just trying to intimidate African Americans from pursuing new economic pursuits. Now they're also trying to intimidate newcomers. The next learning objective is explain the causes and effects of the development in popular culture in the United States over time. The first key concept for this learning objective is about art and literature. Migration gave rise to new forms of art and literature that expressed ethnic and regional identities, such as the Harlem Renaissance movement. Before we cover the Harlem Renaissance, this slide is going to provide context for the different movements of art and literature that occurred in the 1920s. It is based and driven by modernism. That's the idea that in order to move forward, one needs to leave all traditional forms of thought and art behind. The main art form that comes out of this is the Art Deco movement. It's present in art and architecture. The Chrysler Building in New York City is a really good example of what Art Deco architecture looks like. It emphasizes geometric curves and shapes with few hard sides or rough textures. The style was associated with luxury and glamour, so it fits a decade of large economic expansion. Other artists like Edward Hopper painted subjects of urban life. His most famous painting, called Nighthawks, portrays a man and a woman sitting inside of a diner at night from the street's perspective. Jazz and blues are music genres that have been covered in earlier lectures, but they're heavily influenced by black musicians from New Orleans. The mixing of the new genres of music with older classical elements are used masterfully in George Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue. A new literature movement developed partially as a response to the end of World War I. The Lost Generation was a group of writers who came of age during this time. The term Lost Generation was coined by Gertrude Stein, who was herself part of the Lost Generation. These writers experienced the disillusionment due to the sacrifice and devastation of the war. Optimism and hopes of progress were lost. Instead, they wrote more about the uncertainties of the modern world. Lost Generation writers often did most of their work while living abroad. Paris was one such popular melting pot for Lost Generation writers. Ernest Hemingway is a great model for the rest of the Lost Generation. He served in World War I as he volunteered as an ambulance driver in Italy. He was wounded by a mortar shell while going back and forth to the front line. Part of his experience in the war as an ambulance driver led him to write the book A Farewell to Arms. The protagonist was an ambulance driver like himself in World War I who experienced a similar injury and falls in love with one of his nurses. Ultimately, the book is an allegory for the uselessness of war and that everything that comes out of war just ends up leading to death and destruction. F. Scott Fitzgerald was another Lost Generation writer. His most famous work during his lifetime was actually not the most read work of his today. Most people know him for The Great Gatsby, but during his lifetime, his work, This Side of Paradise, resonated with readers a lot more as they tried to come to terms with the significance of the end of the war. The Harlem Renaissance came about as a result of the Great Migration. African Americans from all over the country converged in urban neighborhoods like Harlem and New York City and influenced each other to produce new works that tried to define the black experience in the early 20th century. Langston Hughes was one of the most famous voices of the movement and he wrote fiction, poetry, and essays. Here's two examples of his poetry talking about the black experience. One is more hopeful and the other one is a lot more despondent. The first one is titled I Too. I too sing America. I am the darker brother. They send me to eat in the kitchen when company comes, but I laugh and eat well and grow strong. Tomorrow, I'll be at the table when company comes. Nobody will dare say to me, eat in the kitchen then. Besides, they'll see how beautiful I am and be ashamed. I too am America. The next poem is titled Harlem. What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun? Or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat? or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load, or does it explode? Here Langston Hughes is making some references to what's happening to black people in America. If they continue to have their dreams dashed, are they going to continue to live with it this way, or will it explode into something more violent? For musicians, Duke Ellington and Louis Armstrong were famous jazz band leaders that played in Harlem nightclubs. Billie Holiday was a late addition to the Harlem Renaissance. She moved to Harlem in the late 1920s, and her song Strange Fruit was a criticism of lynching in America. Here are some lyrics from the song. Southern trees bear strange fruit, blood on the leaves and blood on the root. Black bodies swinging in the southern breeze, strange fruit hanging from the poplar trees. Pastoral scene of the gallant south, the bulging eyes and the twisted mouth, scent of magnolia sweet and fresh, then the sudden smell of burning flesh. Here is a fruit for the crows to pluck. For the rain to gather, for the wind to suck, for the sun to rot, for the tree to drop, here is a strange and bitter crop. The strange fruit she's describing were actually bodies hanging from a tree that are being picked at by crows. 
It's a really, really powerful, very descriptive song, sung in a quite haunting manner that masterfully paints the imagery of what it would be like to see a dead body hanging from one of these trees after a lynching. Finally, the last bolded author on here is Sora Neale Hurston. She writes the essay called How It Feels to Be Colored Me. Again, it's another example of hopeful writing of what it's like to be black with the prospect of having your position improve over the years. The final key concept says, in the 1920s, cultural and political controversies emerged as Americans debated gender roles, modernism, science, religion, and issues related to race and immigration. Gender was covered earlier in this lecture, but now women have a greater degree of independence, and that's partly expressed in their fashion. Fashion had always been important because of the power that it has for self-expression. So, dressing with shorter hemlines, cutting hair short, and rebelling against what is expected of women to look like is a move liberating for women. In the 1920s, modernism was a movement that tried to shed traditional thought in the name of progress. It was reflected in the new art and architecture and mostly adapted in urban areas. Rural areas will tend to have a backlash against modernism and more tightly hold on to their traditional views and values. This is the case in science too. The adoption of the theory of evolution was becoming more widespread. Some states like Tennessee had a backlash against it and forbade it to be taught in public schools. The Scopes Monkey Trial refers to when John Scopes, a high school biology teacher in Tennessee, willfully broke the law and got arrested. The newly formed American Civil Liberties Union, or ACLU, comes to the defense of scopes of one of the most famous lawyers in the country, Clarence Darrow. William Jennings Bryan, who had always related more closely with the interest of rural America, acted as the attorney for the prosecution. By this point, he was a former presidential candidate for a major party and former secretary of state. On the grounds that evolution directly contradicted the word of the Bible, Bryan also presented himself as an expert witness on the Bible. When the trial got underway, it seemed that evolution was being put on trial, and not whether or not Scopes had broken the law. Bryant's cross-examination as an expert witness doesn't go great, but it doesn't matter because Scopes had clearly broken the law, and the judge ruled in Bryant's favor. The media following that the case garnered was symbolic of this debate of modernism and a backlash against it. Unfortunately, the case was such a strain on Bryant that he suffered a stroke several days after the trial and died. As seen in the Scopes trial, there is a rise of fundamentalist Christianity, that is, the belief that everything that is said in the Bible is literally true, so therefore anything that may contradict it cannot be true. Fundamentalists blame modernism for the changing morals in society and want things to revert back to the way it was. Racial discrimination against African American and other immigrants, whether they be Southern, or Eastern European, or Latin American, continued to be a problem in the 1920s. Even earlier in the period, the overthrow of black city officials in Wilmington, North Carolina, showed that the gains from Reconstruction were being undone. The KKK was reestablished in 1915 at Stone Mountain. It was inspired by the movie Birth of a Nation by D.W. Griffith. Stone Mountain is a large monument in the state of Georgia, which has become famous since the Klan's rebirth because in 1965 a Confederate monument was carved on the side of it depicting Jefferson Davis, Robert E. Lee, and Stonewall Jackson. One major example of how violence and discrimination continued is the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre. White Tulsans rampaged through the black neighborhoods of Tulsa called Black Wall Street after an attempt to stop the lynching of a black man. The white mob killed black Tulsans in broad daylight and burnt homes and businesses. The final debate includes the question of immigration and the government's role. For immigration, the question had been settled on Eastern Hemisphere immigration through the 1921 and 1924 Quota Acts. Though Latin Americans were still able to migrate into the U.S. and were able to take jobs that would have been filled by other migrants. Latin American migrants still had to endure a greater degree of surveillance as they crossed the border. The top left picture shows Border Patrol checking to make sure that people who came across the border were not carrying weapons. They'd get frisked or targeted due to prejudice. Latin Americans and Mexican American advocacy groups in the 1920s formed to push back against the type of harassment. LULAC is the League of United Latin American Citizens. They met for the first time in 1929 and continued to be active to this present day. The next change in immigration legislation will come in the 1965 Immigration Act under the LBJ administration, and it will impact Latin American immigration. The standard ideology that's adopted through the entire 1920s is that of laissez-faire. The economic prosperity created as a result of World War I and the devastation of Europe is partly responsible for it. Conservative Republican presidents favored lower taxes, less regulation, and higher tariffs. Government revenue actually increased despite the lower taxes due to the greater economic expansion that the U.S. underwent. The Harding administration early in the decade had been ripe with scandal and corruption, though most of it did not become public until after he died. In the Teapot Dome scandal, the Secretary of the Interior, Albert Fall, opened up land for oil leases to oil companies and received bribes or kickbacks for his actions. It's accepted that Harding was unaware of most of the corruption that happened in his administration, though. 
When he died while in office, he was on his way back from Alaska. He was the first sitting president to visit the territory. When Coolidge ascended, he got rid of the bad apples in the administration and continued the pro-business policies. He famously said, the business of government is business. Finally, here's the recap. The role of women changed drastically during the 1920s. Immigration was severely restricted through the 1921 and 1924 Quota Acts, art movements fueled by the end of World War I, urbanization, and racism. Modernism brought major changes in hopes of continued prosperity. But, as we'll talk about in the next lecture, that hope of prosperity is going to come crashing down with the Great Depression. Thank you for watching. If you would like to watch the next lecture, you can click the video link on the screen. And if you're looking for more practice to help you on the AP exam, you can visit apushlights.com. I wish you the very best in all of your studying and look forward to seeing you back in the next lecture.